cannabis has been unlawful, uh, prohibited in this country since 1923. And we have a whole history of uh, prosecutions and so on. So criminal lawyers uh, need to be, uh, are still going to be involved in issues that continue to rise until they legalize, as well as the impact of the promise to legalize that's ongoing in terms of their practices. And there are medical uh, licensed producers that exist now for some 15 to 17 years. And so we have lawyers representing the licensed producers. We have lawyers representing patients. We have other forms of uh, distribution through compassion clubs and dispensaries. The dispensary issue is a big issue here and in Toronto. Um, and we have uh, issues that are going to arise in terms of not uh, uh, only employment and employees in the workplace and the types of work they do and how it might uh, be impacted if they're medically approved or otherwise, as well as the impaired driving issue, whether it's driving a car or flying an airplane or, or uh, operating complex machinery. So, you know, it's been prohibited and people haven't been supposed to use it. Then legal medical use uh, b came into existence 2003 and many many changes in the regulations throughout that period and now we're going to be facing legalization and all the legal issues that are going to arise from that. Well I'm hoping that uh, Susan will be able to present uh, to the lawyers what the task force recommended. Uh, not just generally but also particularly in terms of the role of the federal government so there'll be comparisons in relation to tobacco and alcohol and things like that. Uh, what they recommended in terms of the role of the provincial government, remembering that we live in a constitutional democracy with a division of powers between the federal government and the provincial governments, and when the federal government decides to withdraw its criminal law power, that uh, brings in the constitutional jurisdiction of the provinces in relation to distribution, like with alcohol and, and so on. And then, of course, most importantly, local government, because uh, it's local government that deals with zoning, uh, all kinds of other bylaw issues that arise, um, and they will have a great impact on where there are dispensaries or stores uh, through their local government powers. And so um, there's going to be quite a, a bit of activity there, I would suspect, for people who uh, represent either local government or people uh, involved with local government. Well, unlike alcohol, uh, you know, people don't usually drink and then go to work, and if they smell of alcohol and so on, their employer may have something to say about it. Uh, but lots of people may take medications prescribed by their doctors uh, and still go to work. Some of those medications may enable them to work better than if they don't have their medication. And cannabis falls into this, this area. People have tended to think of, of it in a stigmatized sort of way that if somebody takes a bit of marijuana, they're going to be right out of it and not be able to do anything, when in fact we now know uh, from the many, many studies that exist in relation to cannabis that for some people it will enable them to focus better and work better. And yet at the same time, if their work involves uh, driving or operating complex machinery, and if they are novice or intermittent users of cannabis, uh, we certainly don't want them in the workplace being intoxicated where they might cause harm to others. Uh, and yet employers have to also accommodate people from a human rights perspective in terms of different issues that they may have, whether they're medical or other issues. So there's going to be, especially initially, a number of tensions that arise as between employers and what their rules are in relation to people working and maybe being under the influence of cannabis and uh, you know doing various tasks, some of which shouldn't be any problem at all if you're under the influence of cannabis and some of them that might. And that also raises the issue of the individuals because it still impacts different people different ways. Chronic medical users, for example, develop a significant tolerance and may not be impaired at all or very slightly, whereas the novice user or the intermittent user may become quite impaired. So it's not a simple black and white issue in terms of what the employer may or may not want depending upon the particular job, what the employee may 
to feel or want given their ability to perform their tasks. So um, I can see a, a lot of issues arising that straddle the impaired alcohol scene at the workplace through to the prescribed drug scene in the workplace with cannabis being in there as well. The importance of that is to bring everybody up to date. You always hear, oh, we need more studies, we need more studies. And there's no question that prohibition has limited the number of studies available. But the reality is, is there's over 24,000 studies. If you go on PubMed, check it out online. Uh, it's actually been studied more than most other drugs with greater cohorts than uh, ibuprofen and Adderall, these sorts of things. Uh, and so there is a lot of, of studies, but we recently have the National Academy of Sciences report out of the U.S. just last month, which sort of does an analysis of all of these studies and grades them according to whether there's conclusive evidence or no evidence or little evidence. And so there's a nice uh, analysis of at least 10,000 of the 24,000 studies so that uh, Dr. Page will bring everybody up to date hopefully in terms of what is going on, what the evidence is, and what the impact is of consumption, whether it's smoked or eaten or, you know, through vaporization, all these different uh, ways that people consume it. So hopefully we will get a, a complete update for everybody that they can then take away into the context of the other legal issues arising. There's a lot of concern that there's going to be all these people impaired, when in fact the evidence is that I think 97% of the impaired driving cases are alcohol, only 3% are other drugs. And we know that the impact of cannabis is very, very different than the impact of alcohol in terms of what people can do or not do. Uh, it's more like a distracted driving thing in terms of cannabis use compared to the speeding and reckless stuff that you see with, with alcohol. And so some of the experts say, you know, look, we've had lots of people driving under the influence of prescribed drugs and cannabis for a long period of time. Sure, there will be more. And people shouldn't drive while intoxicated. But again, there's this individual thing. So you're going to get the chronic medical user who may not be impaired at all and the novice user who will. And so we're going to need to grapple with that in terms of we have a, a criminal law that you're not to drive while your ability to do, do so is impaired by alcohol or a drug. So that law is still there. And while they've hived off the, the alcohol into sort of an administrative procedure, at least in this province, they can initially criminal law is still going to be applied in relation to cannabis use and driving. But also, until there is legalization, we still have mandatory minimum sentences in this country for a production of five or more plants up to 200 and then graduated up to over 500. We have mandatory minimums if certain aggravating factors exist, if people are selling or trafficking, uh, and those issues are still being litigated in front of the courts. We still have civil forfeiture where if you use your house to produce cannabis illegally, you can lose your house or your truck if you're transporting it, so offense-related property. Uh, and that's still a, a big issue that's ongoing. And we have, well, the impact of the government saying it's going to legalize on such concepts as sentencing, denunciation and deterrence. You know, we have a case out of Saskatchewan that we will discuss called Neary, where the court found that the decibel level for denunciation and deterrence has gone down because of uh, the promise to legalize. So I think lawyers will want to know what's going on between now and when we do legalize and then what the issues are once we do. Kirk Tusa and I are co-chairing the program and the two of us have been involved in uh, cannabis issues for some considerable period of time and we hope that we will be uh, giving everyone, lawyers and non-lawyers alike, uh, an update on not only what's gone on historically, but most importantly, what's developing and going to occur uh, perhaps in the spring if the government introduces the legislation for legalization. So we think this is going to be of interest to a wide variety of lawyers on both sides of the various issues, but also to non-lawyers so that they know what's coming up and how it may impact them either as individuals or their companies or businesses 
And we hope you'll join us on March the 9th, 2017.